everybody. This is Tony Turner, and welcome to The Market Now as of Friday, March the 5th, at the market's close. Well, Wall Street surged in volatile trading today, with the NASDAQ rebounding at the end of a week that saw it extend losses earlier today to about 10% from its previous record high. And for those of you who don't know, when the market falls off its highs by 10%, that's considered to be a correction. Um, okay, so all, th all three main indexes bounced back from losses earlier in the day, with investors in recent sessions spooked by rising interest rates that offset optimism about an economic rebound. And on that note, let's go on to three charts that could give us some insight into the week to come. First of all, as we always do, we're going to look at a daily chart of the S&P 500 spider symbol SPY. This is the ETF that closely follows our benchmark S&P 500 index. Now, as you can see on this chart, we're going to look at the closing high here. On February 12th, the, the SPY made the most recent all-time closing high at $392.64. As you know, then it popped up for a day, then rolled to this downside. And here's, you can see these really volatile candles here. Here's where the interest rates, uh, this is where the interest rates started to rise. And this is what's caused the market so much turbulence. Um, when I captured this chart today, the SPY was trading at $383.55, that's about $38.35 on the S&P 500 itself. Now you can see here, can you see the green line? This is the 50-day simple moving average. This is a very important av moving average in the world of technical analysis. And we really care because a lot of institutional investors watch this line very closely. And it's kind of on the order of, of if the asset falls below the 50-day moving average, then they're not as inclined to be happy about it as they are if what we're looking at is trading above the 50-day moving average. Now, the, the red line up here is the 20-day moving average. And the SPY had actually traded above that ever since uh, last the beginning of last November, dipped dipped down below it a couple of times, but generally stayed above it for a lot of last year and then into this year. Of course, we know it dipped down in January, but then it popped back up. And then recently, of course, we got all this volatility. And you can see when the bulls and bears are fighting, because when you see uh, candles such as this toward the end of January and most of the time during this uptrend, look at the narrow range days. They're small orderly candles marching along all in order the way they should. Uh, however, when the candles get um, higher highs and lower lows every day and the bulls and bears tug all day and make great big um, price swings in the daily price action, then you can see the bulls and bears are duking it out. They're fighting it out because they're disagreeing. And that makes for what we call volatility or wide price swings. So again, um, the SPY closed at $383.55, white knuckling the 50-day moving average. Uh, we do uh, have support here at, so far, the 50-day moving average. Support meaning it's trading above it. And the support is, the 50-day moving average is coming in at $381. So just a couple of dollars difference there. Um, we also have uh, some support here at the October highs. That's coming in at about 353, 354. Then we can look down to the chart here and see that the 200-day moving average, the black line is coming in at $346.50. We definitely do not want the SPY to go below the 200-day moving average. That is for sure. So there is a lot of potential support here, but the key is going to be do interest rates uh, continue higher? And if they do, uh, then that could bode more downside for the SPY uh, into 
in, into the week to come. Now, one way to tell if interest rates, a lot of you say, well, that's great, but how do I know if interest rates are moving higher or lower? This is going to be, um, if, if you look at the IEF, that's the 7 to 10 year bond. And if you look at that, if it is moving lower, that means interest rates are moving higher. So if the IEF is moving lower, and you could just look at it on a daily chart, if it is generally moving lower, then that could mean that um, that the SPY and, and other indexes may tend to move lower with this. This is not a tick by tick comparison by any stretch, but this is the ETF, uh, the IEF again, which is the seven to 10 year bond. If the bond is moving lower, that means interest rates are moving higher. And if they're moving higher, that tends to send the market lower. Uh, if this is still going on next week, we'll have a little more of a lesson on that and on uh, interest rates. Okay, so on that note, uh, please be careful if the SPY is moving lower and moves below the 50-day moving average. Very important. Okay, our next chart today, as we usually do, we're going to look at the Invesco QQQ, symbol QQQ. Of course, this is a daily chart. The QQQ represents the NASDAQ 100, a very powerful index in in our stock market. And the top holdings include all of the momentum stocks, the Amazons, the Alphabets, the Facebooks, uh, and certainly the Intels and Microsofts of the world. Uh, now you can see how, as they have said in the last few weeks, tech stocks have sold off and they really have, uh, they really have. The QQQ is made an all time high February 12th at $336.45. Then just like the SPY, it, 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 it gapped up for a day and then fell. But as you can see, definitely fell below the 20 day, definitely fell below the 50 day moving average. And this has given uh, quite a shock to a lot of people in the stock market who haven't been trading for a long time and thought that these tech stocks would go up forever. Please do know that the economies of industrialized nations move in cycles. Uh, that means up and down <laughs> and sometimes sideways. Uh, so we made that high up here at 336.45, then rolled over, came to the downside. Today, when I captured this chart, the QQQ at the close traded at $308.68. Now, this is approximately 9% off of this all time high. So we're not back down in the 10% correction territory. Um, we, we're squeaking through with 9% at least of the, as of the close today. We made a low today, the QQQ made a low today of $297.45. Kind of interesting because if you go left on your chart and if you look at these two highs that were made, in October and November, and you draw a straight line. Let's see if I can pull it off. And you draw a straight line. Oh, pretty good, Tony, for whoop, a little crease in it there, huh? So if you do that, you can see what once was resistance, right? What once was resistance, then as support, when price was below it, 297 was resistance. Price climbed over it, it acted as support. Price moved up much higher than that line, then came back and tested it yesterday and today. And again, the winning number here was 297, 298, we can call it if you wanna round it off to 300. So that is now potential support for the QQQ. Um, so this 297 now, we have resistance here at 313. We talked about that last week. So uh, we could see some selling come in. Should the QQQ be able to push up and into this prior res was support now resistance area? Uh, of course, the 50-day moving average could could act as as a little bit of a, 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 a showstopper here. Maybe, maybe not. We'll have to see. 
But at any rate, what we do know for sure is that we want 297 to 300 to hold since the queues are down below the 50-day moving average. Of course, we can always look at the 200-day moving average here coming in at 284. Now, you might say, Tony, why do we even care what the SPY does and what the QQQ does? You care because the stocks in these indexes, not all of them, but many of them, will will follow the index higher, yes, but definitely follow it lower. Not 100%, but many, many stocks. If the SPY, the S&P 500 rolls over, four out of five stocks will follow it to the downside. And a huge percentage of tech stocks will follow the QQQ to the downside. So that is why you care. These act as almost a crystal ball to tell you when the market is, uh, well, certainly, it's not even a crystal ball. It's absolute fact when the market is trending higher or when it needs to take a rest, as it's doing right now. You may want to see a firm bottom, wherever that turns out to be, in these indexes before you start purchasing stocks, at least uh, at least for longer term uh, longer term trades. So we do know here that we want to watch the QQQ and make darn sure it holds 297 to 300. And uh, for sure, if it goes lower, then sometimes the best place to be is on the sidelines. Okay, let's go on to our third chart now. Our last chart for the day is the Invesco Dynamic Food and Beverage ETF, the PBJ. Uh, the, uh, isn't that a cool, uh, isn't that a cool, um, uh, code PBJ. I thought that was very, very cool for a stock symbol. Okay, uh, the PBJ has 30 components in it. Top holdings include Kraft Heinz, Coca-Cola, Keurig Dr. Pepper, and Constellation Brands. Now, nice looking chart. If we look left on the chart back here to June, we can see that in June, <clears throat> the PBJ made a low down here of $29.70. Since then, it kind of moved sideways, came back down, got over the 50-day moving average, moved up here in a nice little up move here from uh, Ju uh, July through August, fell down a little bit in September, back through the moving averages, found dubious, but, but support that held at the 200-day moving average, back up through, made a little double top move here, came back down to retest the 200-day moving average, and then started up and jumped over the 20-day moving average, moving up, now walking up the 20-day moving average line very nicely. Uh, what it did here was it did, um, <clears throat> it did come up to a recent relative high of about 40 here in January and moved down to close at 35, where it established some resistance here fell down to that line and fell down to 37, okay, went back up to that line at about 39, couldn't get over it again, first part of February, came back down to the 50-day moving average. Uh, now, notice that these companies did not move down dramatically uh, for the last week. Why is that? Because food is a staple, because I, I've been watching corn prices, soybean prices, and wheat prices, actually sugarcane as well. Those have all been moving higher for a while now. So it makes sense that um, food prices are going to rise. Um, what I'm looking at here is the PBJ. Another thing is, do I want to be in tech stocks next week? You can, I probably won't do it. I, I, I still wanna make sure that there's more of a bottom or, or a definitive trading bottom in before I get into anything a little more glitzy. So I'm gonna go hide out, <coughs> excuse me, hide out in something humans have to have and that would be food. So that's why I'm looking at the PBJ. Now in the coming week, today it closed at $38.87. The 50-day moving average down here below it is at $37.29. It's back above its 20-day moving average and its 50-day moving average. And I'm going to draw a line, a resistance line across here. So if in the coming week the PBJ can move up and over 
this line and, and move up to $39. Uh, I'm going to add a small position to my trading portfolio. And I say small because the market's pretty dicey right now. I have an initial stop I'm going to put in at $37. That will be below the 50-day moving average. And if, and this for the PVJ, it's now up near all-time highs. So if it can move up over 40 and move up to 42 then I will add uh, more shares to my portfolio. I want to make sure this continues. And yes, by then, if it moves up again, it's going to be in blue sky territory because these are near all-time highs. So uh, by then, of course, I'm going to have a trailing stop. Again, a <laughs> trailing stop if it moves up to that point. Actually, if it moves up over 40, 41, I'll probably make my stop a trailing stop. So um, you may you may want to keep an eye on the PVJ in the coming week. It may be somewhere to kind of hang out if it gets more uh, a little more volatile again. So on that note, before we go on to final thoughts, please know that if you'd like to become a more successful trader, this is a great time. It really is a great time to check out my trader training programs. You're going to love my powerful strategies devoted to swing trading, trend trading, bottom fishing, and many more. My programs are easy to understand, and they can help you increase your gains quickly and easily. To see all of my online training programs, simply go to the link on this screen right here, or click on the orange button you see below. And now, let's go on to some final thoughts. Our question for the week is, do I grade my trades and adjust my risk accordingly? Do I grade my trades? This is something that really helped me, especially in the early days of trading. A great way of helping keep a solid, confident mindset when trading is to grade your trades. An A trade is made with a plan in place. It's made with an optimum entry and with all signals that go in the market and in your stock sector. That includes uptrends on a daily chart, which of course is what you want to see when you're making, getting into an, a, a trade. Um, you want strong volume, lots of people at the party buying is what I used to say. And a good looking weekly and or monthly chart of that same stock only takes you a minute. And a quick check of the fundamentals. These are all components of a high probability trade. If you didn't get that all down, just rewind this and play that last minute again. Now that's an A trade. A B trade may be entered with some forethought and a quickly devised plan. Okay, I'll get in here and I'll get here and there, there. You may have heard an analyst on a financial network recommend a stock. And maybe you gave the chart a cursory glance and maybe you saw a good uh, entry level and then bought shares. Hopefully you reasoned before the other viewers had a chance. Or maybe you bought a stock without analyzing its fundamentals at all. Maybe you don't even know what sector it's in. Maybe you were just going on the chart and that can work for, for quick day trades, but for longer term trades, not so much. Hey, maybe you just like the setup. Or maybe your stock sector is headed south, but you think this stock will buck the trend. All of those things make a B trade. They're not awful and terrible, but, but you don't have everything going for you either. Now, a C trade could be a stock you chased to enter, knowing you were late in the upswing, but praying it would move higher anyway. By the way, hope and prayer that those aren't strategies. Great strategies away from trading, but not when you're doing it. You're not really sure maybe where you should place your stop. You don't have a plan in place. So that makes it an impulse trade and it could end up being a real gut grinder or even a losing trade. So when we get into the habit of automatically grading our trades, hopefully before you even enter it, it can make us and save us a lot of money. The action of grading your trades forces you to take responsibility for your trades. Indeed, continued use of this concept can, in certain situations, uh, even cause us to pause and rethink trades before we hit the buy button. So start grading your trades with your next trade entry. 
Get in the habit of entering only A graded trades. I believe you will find grading your trades a great tool to move you on the journey toward trading success. Finally, if you'd like to become a more successful trader, check out my trader training programs. To see all of my online training programs, simply go to the link on this screen or click on the orange button below. Until next week, get green on your screen. I'm Tony Turner, and this is The Market Now.